Have you ever wondered why there are so many different forms of practicing Sikhi today? There are different institutions, Jathe Bandiya, Sants, Babas, and amongst them a wide spectrum of Sikh philosophy, beliefs, and codes of conduct. What are the true origins of all of these? It can be quite confusing to make sense of it all. How did all of this happen, and how did we get to this point? In order to answer this question, in this episode we'll be looking at some of the very early forms of Sikhi and relating it to practices in the modern era. Some of what you'll see will surprise you and may even shock you. The early sects in this episode form the very building blocks of the modern day mix we now take for granted. A whole universe of different Sikh sects existed in the diverse landscape of what was pre-colonial Punjab. Watching this, you may even think that some of these sects were so far removed from what is now Sikh doctrine that these groups weren't even Sikh. You may also find a lot of the practices of the pre-colonial Khalsa do not fit the worldview and morality that we've grown up with. But as you're watching, always try remembering that the lens with which you view the world and the lens with which the Sikhs of the time viewed the world are both completely different. All of the Sikhs at the time would have had the belief that they were practicing Sikhi true to the form of the Gurus just as we do now. So sit back, get yourself comfortable and enjoy this journey back in time. In our last episode, we concluded with the formation of the Khalsa. It had caused a great schism between the Sikhs. A feud between the Khalsa and the Khulasa erupted in Amritsar in 1710. Khulasa was a word used to describe Sikhs who had not been initiated into the Khalsa with Khande Di Bol. Khulasa, literally meaning lesser, Kulasa can also be interchangeably used with Sehejdari. The dichotomy between the Khalsa and the Kulasa will be a prominent theme of this documentary. Though the Khalsa was by far the most prominent group both in numbers and influence, the legacy of the Khulasa groups can't be ignored, and understanding these will make the modern-day landscape of present-day Sikhi much easier to understand. We'll be using this diagram to help us show the evolution of Sikhi and its denominations through the ages. Admittedly, we acknowledge that this map has its limitations, as in pre-colonial India, religious boundaries were often quite blurred. In the West, however, with Abrahamic religions, religious sects emerge more so out of differences in core beliefs. Religious boundaries are thus much more distinguishable and easier to understand when looking at the different sects within Judaism, Christianity and Islam. You could also argue that we're applying our own Western lens to the Indic world in trying to find out where the boundaries lie. And finally, this is also not an exhaustive list of every Sikh sect to have ever existed, but we aim to highlight the most important and consequential. We still hope that this map may make the evolution of Sikhi much easier for you to understand. Feel free to use the chapters to navigate to the sections which interest you the most. However, as you'll see, given how interconnected the Sikh universe is, the narrative of this documentary will make much more sense over a continuous viewing. After the formation of the Khalsa and after the death of Guru Gobind Singh, the concept of the living Guru amongst the orthodox Sikh tradition ended. It was proclaimed that the divine being manifested itself through the Guru Granth and the Guru Panth. This was recognised to be the source of liberation for Khalsa Sikhs. The unity of the early Khalsa was first tested in 1721 and a major schism erupted after the death of Bandar Singh Bahadur. Bandar Singh Bahadur was a general who had been initiated with Khande Di Paul by Guru Gobind Singh and had usurped huge swathes of Mughal territories in Punjab. He celebrated his military conquests and newly found sovereignty by minting coins in the name of Guru Nanak and Guru Gobind Singh. The Mughals responded to Khalsa victories by sending an imperial force under the command of Mughal Emperor Bahadur Shah himself to help crush the threat the Khalsa had posed to Mughal hegemony. After many battles, Banda was eventually captured by the Mughals and was tortured to death for defying the Mughal state. The brutal nature of his martyrdom and his impressive military exploits led many amongst the Khalsa to posthumously recognise Banda as their 11th Guru and they formed a sect called the Bandai Khalsa. The Bandai Khalsa are said to have broken away from Khalsa norms and centred themselves on embodying Banda's legacy and traditions instead. Instead of greeting each other with Vaheguru Ji Ki Fateh, they are referenced to have instead used the slogan Fateh Darshan. Interestingly, one of the earliest European accounts of the time on the Sikhs actually confuses Banda's name using Fateh Darshan instead. Whilst blue was the uniform of the Khalsa, 
Bandai warriors wore red, whilst the Khalsa consumed meat which wasn't slaughtered in a Muslim manner. Bandai Khalsa adopted a strict Vaishnavite vegetarian diet. As referenced in one of Banda's own hukamnamas to a Sangat, this dietary code also involved abstaining from onions. This most likely stems from Banda's origins as a Vishnu Bairagi prior to taking Kande Dipal. To note, the present dispute in Rehat between meat eaters and vegetarians isn't particularly new. The historical Rehat Nami of the 18th century and the plethora of Sikh literature from the early 19th century suggest that meat eating was very common amongst Khalsa Sikhs. A poet from Guru Gobind Singh's court, Bhai Nandalal, famous for the Raj Karega Khalsa couplet, prohibited meat only slaughtered as per the Muslim manner or meat of the Turks. A whole host of 18th century Rehat Nameh, including the ones listed on screen, as well as British accounts of the Khalsa, all reinforced the idea of this early Khalsa only shunning halal meat as well as beef. The present day Akal Takat Mariada also issues the same edicts on halal meat. Nonetheless, different modern day Jatebandia have their own Mariada, which mandates vegetarianism, of which we will see. To continue with the narrative, this early Khalsa, which did not accept Banda as their guru, later came to be projected as the Tat Khalsa in later Sikh writings, with Tat meaning pure. For simplicity's sake, we'll be using this term to distinguish the Bandai and the Tat Khalsas. From all of Mata Sundari's Hukumname, there is one in particular which exists, where she had warned the Sangat against following any human guru after Guru Gobind Singh, which included the splinter group, the Bandai Khalsa. Her Hukumnamas also addressed the Sangat of this unified body as the Khalsa of Akalpurakh. It is said in later Sikh sources that the Bandai Khalsa wanted an equal share in the management of the Gurdwaras and an equal say in the wider affairs of the Pant. The Tata Khalsa, on the other hand, were unwilling to compromise on this. Matters came to a head between the two tribes during the Vasaki of 1721. This gathering was described as a Sarbat Khalsa. Mata Sundari had sent Bai Mani Singh to be the head Granti of Harmandar Sab a year earlier to mediate this dispute which had been brewing. The schism was said to be settled by the casting of lots, but the Tat Khalsa came out successful, proclaiming that this was due to divine intervention. Individual members of the two sides also agreed to wrestle outside the Akal Takht, where the Tat Khalsa declared victory. It is mentioned in later Sikh sources that the Tat Khalsa brought the Bandai Khalsa members back into their fold through the feeding of pork. This wouldn't have been an uncommon practice during the 18th century, as is referenced in both British and Sikh sources, like the one on screen, describing the Khalsa using pork as a means of initiating new converts to test against possible infiltration. This was then an especially common practice amongst new Islamic converts to Sikhi. Khalsa Sikhs seeking converts was not an uncommon practice in the 18th century, with a multitude of European sources suggesting this as one of the deviances from the Hindu fold. This is shown on screen where one such European was offered Khande Dipal on his visit to Takht Patna Sahib. Despite the Bandai Khalsa being enveloped into the Tat Khalsa, a line of descendants of Banda's lineage continue to this day. They reside in Dera Banda Bahadur in Jammu. Due to the patronage given to them by Maharaja Ranjit Singh, they also extended their preaching up towards Sindh, where there have been reports of some Bandais residing. In modernity, they are well within the mainstream Khalsa fold. They prefer their woman folk to marry amongst only Bandais, and they retain certain customs such as a special mention of Banda and some of his descendants after the evening Ardas. The Hukumnama of Mata Sundri also mentions avoiding the followers of Ajit Singh. Little is known about Guru Ajit Singh, who is not to be confused with Sahabzada Ajit Singh. Guru Ajit Singh was instead Mata Sundari's adopted son and set up his own seat as a guru for 14 years after the death of Guru Gobind Singh. Interestingly, he is thought to have held the favour of Mughal Emperor Bahadur Shah, who saw him as the heir to Guru Gobind Singh. This was during the time Banda Singh Bahadur was immersed in his campaigns against the Mughals in Punjab. There also appears to have been tension between Guru Ajit Singh and Mata Sundari, who had distanced herself from him. He is known to have had a specific following called the Jeet Malias, and he was succeeded by his son Hati Singh, who left Delhi and went to Mathura. There are few Persian and Sikh sources about these gurus, so it's much harder to determine what their specific doctrines and practices actually were.
We covered the very early Khalsa in our last episode, and our chapter here continues in brief the story of the Khalsa's triumph through the 18th century. The Khalsa embodied the orthodox line of the Guru's spiritual message and military might, and they adhered to the Guru Granth and Guru Pant in the strongest possible sense. Whilst the Adi Granth was given the Guruship, the Dasam Granth was seen in a similar light to the Adi Granth, and is said to have provided the Khalsa with its zeal for war. The Khalsa saw itself as having a duty of continuing Guru Gobind Singh's legacy and mission. Although there is little way in an age before colonial censuses to determine how many Sikhs were actually Khalsa Sikhs, many early British observers like Joseph Cunningham imply that they considered Sikhs as being largely synonymous with the Khalsa. In 1849 he commented, The great development of the tenets of Guru Gobind has thrown other denominations into the shade. Many Khalsa Rehatnamma, or codes of conduct, from the 18th century still exist today, which provide us with remarkable insights into the lifestyle of the Khalsa. These Rehatnamma dictated social and political codes of conduct for the Khalsa during this early period in their history. They provided the Khalsa with strict guidance, ranging all the way from their daily prayers to their ethics in war. The spiritual component of the Rehatnamma underscore the importance of waking up early in the morning and reciting Gurbani. The Rehatnami emphasize on Japji Sahib and Jab Sahib being read in the morning, with Reharas in the evening and Sohella before bed. However, with less standardization, the specific prayers likely varied amongst different groups. The modern-day Akal Takat Maryada adds 10 Savaiye to the Japji and Jab in the morning. Nowadays, there is an emphasis on Panjabaniya or five prayers in the morning, especially amongst different Jathebandiya. All of these Khalsa Rehetname were amalgamated through much scholarship during the Singh Sabha period and formed the basis of what has become the SGPC's Mariada, which many Khalsa Sikhs follow today. The word Sardar is now regarded as an honorific and colloquial title for Sikhs at large, but is believed to have been adopted by the Khalsa in the mid-1700s. This is a turbulent period which followed multiple Persian and Afghan invasions. Khalsa Sikh chieftains emerged victorious and began to occupy large territories throughout the Punjab. These Khalsa Sikh chieftains were given the title of Sardar, which meant commander or lord or sir, and had previously been used by elite aristocrats of the Indic, Turkic and Persianate sphere. The Sardars were the leaders of these 12 missiles or armies, and all would have been inducted into the Khalsa fold as a mandate by Khandedi Bal. Interestingly, some British sources suggest that the Sardars wore large karas to distinguish themselves, and which symbolised their chiefdom amongst their subjects. A famous British quote from this period personifies the Khalsa as being a snake with many heads. Whilst these Sardars had fierce rivalries amongst one another for territory, they were bound by their moral codes of conduct in Khalsa Rehatname, and often allied whenever faced with an external threat. Together, these 12 different missile confederacies formed the Dal Khalsa, which would meet biannually at Vasaki and Diwali, to pass resolutions called Gurmatas. These large-scale gatherings were known as Sarbat Khalsas, and as a British source of the time suggests, it was where the Khalsa would consult upon its warlike operations. By the turn of the 19th century, the charismatic Sukarchakia missile chieftain Ranjit Singh united these different missiles and consolidated their vast territory and brought about the Sikh empire, the Khalsa Raj. Since the empire's beginning, large land grants were given to prominent Sardars, Khalsa Sikhs and especially Singhs who had previously had minuscule numbers in different villages due to intense persecution, now dispersed throughout the Punjab and received lavish patronage and territorial command. Before the Anglo-Sikh War, over half of the Khalsa army's generals and commanders were Khalsa Singhs. Following the empire's demise, the Khalsa army was disbanded and its most important Sardars, seen to be rebels, were stripped off large areas of their land by the British. They saw a 92% reduction of their annual income. Individuals seen to be openly hostile to the British were deported from the Punjab, and tight control was imposed over this newly annexed territory. Many former soldiers enlisted into the British Indian Army for employment, but this came with a demand for absolute loyalty to the colonial regime. All of this, along with the Indian Arms Act, which significantly reduced their capacity to carry weapons, led to the gradual pacification of the Khalsa Sikh. It's important to note, however, that the states below the Satluj River remained semi-autonomous as they had accepted protection under the British by 1809. The British employed their own Mahants, 
a management committee and a manager to control important gurdwaras like Harimandar Sahib. Traditionally, these had been under the control of a sardar employed by Maharaja Ranjit Singh and his successors. These changes which came with colonialism eventually led to a severe decline in gurdwara etiquette. These gurdwaras were only returned back into complete Sikh control following the Akali movement and the formation of the SGPC in 1920. The Akali movement of the 1920s shouldn't be confused with the Akali Nihangs, which brings us to our next chapter. The Akali Nihangs can be defined by the Akali meaning immortal and Nihang in Persian meaning crocodile. The original Persianate pronunciation is Nihang and the word was in fact used in one of the most famous historical Persianate poetic texts, the Shahnameh as a crocodile metaphor for a warrior of fearsome courage who couldn't be stopped. In early British censuses, the Akali Nihangs were sometimes even colloquially observed to be the Gobind Singhis, the Singhs of Guru Gobind Singh, in sharp contrast to another prominent sect, the Nanak Bantis. The Akali Nihangs in their literature stake their claim from the time of Guru Gobind Singh. However, there's no references of the Akali Nihangs being an organised group from this time in literature. The first real prominence of the Akali Nihangs in Sikh literature comes from the middle to late 1700s. They were referenced in the Deya Singh Rehetnam of this period and there are many other contemporary sources from the later 18th century which credit their existence. Their first mention from European sources appear at around this time too. They also hold an oral tradition from Abchal Nagar Hazur Sab in high regard where they narrate their origins. And there's no evidence of the Buddha Dal's claim of Nawab Kapoor Singh, Sardar Jassa Singh Aluwalia, and their predecessors being Akali Nihangs. There is evidence, however, of the Akali Nihangs forming part of one of the 12 missiles of the time. The missile was known as the Shaheed Missile. This was founded by one of the most decorated Sikh warriors of the period, Baba Deep Singh. Baba Deep Singh was consecrated into Khalsa folklore after his martyrdom in the precincts of Harmandar Sab at the hands of the Afghans. His Shaheed missile continued as an independent entity until its submission to Maharaja Ranjit Singh. After Ranjit Singh amalgamated the Shaheed missile into his domain, the Akalis retained their own regiment within the Khalsa Raj, known as the Akal Regiment. They were found to be vehemently anti-British both before and after the annexation, and the British saw them as fanatics. A famous incident in 1808 involved a scuffle between British sepoys and the Akali Nihangs, which were led by Akali Nihang Fulla Singh. This was witnessed by both the British administrator Metcalf and Maharaja Ranjit Singh, which led to Metcalf labelling Akali Fulla Singh as a firebrand on reporting back to his superiors. The Akali Nihangs have adopted the nomenclature Buddadal, elderly division over 40s, and Tarnadal, youth division of under 40s. This is not to be confused with the same names used in the original division of the missiles under Nawab Kapoor Singh. This missile formation of the Buddadal and Tarnadal was eventually disbanded under Maharaja Ranjit Singh. It's to note there's no mention of the Buddadal and Tarnadal in sources about the Akali Nihangs in the 1700s. In all likelihood, this nomenclature was adopted later in the 1800s by the Akali Nihangs for themselves once the two units were disbanded by Maharaja Ranjit Singh for the Khalsa army at large. The Akali Nihangs also followed the same 18th century Rehetname of the wider Khalsa, which were covered in our previous chapter. Akali Nihangs have always been well within the Khalsa fold. Nonetheless, it's important to differentiate the Akali Nihangs as a sect for the purposes of this documentary, as they are now occasionally being thought of as what was the only form of the 18th century Khalsa. This may be due to the present confusion of their current practices in relation to most other Amritari Sikhs today as well as their use of the nomenclature Buddadal and Tarnadal, which was then a division amongst the Khalsa missiles as a whole. It should thus be clarified that most of the early Khalsa Sardars were not Akali Nihangs, even though they shared a great overlap in practices. An easy way to differentiate the Akali Nihangs is by their differences in appearance to the traditional Khalsa Sardars of the Missal era. The Akali Nihangs dressed themselves in blue and adorned tall dumallas or the Starbungas with weapons, which were held by a quit, strapping themselves with iron and eating out of iron or sarbalo vessels. Like the Khalsa at large, the Akali Nihangs were generally not celibate. To note, 
Although in the last chapter we discussed the early Tata Khalsa at large also wearing blue, by the late 18th century the Tata Khalsa also adopted different colour clothing, including also red. The Akali Nihangs have maintained this distinct blue clothing, which is referenced in a variety of British sources of this era. The Akali Nihangs have maintained a strong emphasis on the martial Dasam Grant, as well as revering the Sarbalo Grant too. Along with the Odasis and in much smaller numbers the Nirmalas, the Akali Nihangs formed custodianship of the premier Sikh shrines in the pre-colonial period. Prior to Khalsa Raj, sources suggest that the Akalis played a large role at the biannual Khalsa gatherings of Vesakhi and Diwali at the Akal Takht. British sources also suggest their importance in admitting Sikhs into the Khalsa fold at the four Takhts of pre-colonial India. As explained in the previous videos, prior to the Namdari movement during the colonial period, Khande Di Pol was a lot less accessible and was largely limited to being available at the four Takhts. After the Khalsa Raj was established, Sikh polity shifted more towards Lahore and so the power of these biannual gatherings mediated by the Akalis at the Akal Takht reduced. A Sardar of the Maharaja's choice now had ultimate control over the Harmandar Sahib complex as a whole. However, it is cited in multiple British sources about the prominent sway the Akalis held at the Akal Bunga on the eve of the British entering Punjab. Much like the Khalsa at large, the influence of the Akali Nihangs shrunk greatly during the colonial era. Their traditional role in giving Khande Di Pol would diminish due to the changing nature of the social landscape and their role as custodians of the Gurdwaras would weaken too. Feuds formed between different sects and the Nirmala Mahant Ganesha Singh in particular reserved scathing comments for the Akali Nihangs for their lifestyle. In particular, their consumption of meat and intoxicants this mutual quarrel will be explained further in the Nirmala section. To note, the Akali Nihang's use of intoxicants would have been supported by some of the Khalsa Rehatname of the 18th century, which show differing stances on intoxicants like cannabis and alcohol, while the Chopa Singh and Deya Singh Rehatname strictly prohibit intoxicants completely. The Desa Singh Rehatname, however, allows for intoxicants in small quantities. The Prem Sumara Grant also cautiously allows alcohol. Intoxicants are also referenced within the Dasam Grant too, and British eyewitness sources of the 1700s attest the Khalsa's use of these. The use of intoxicants is banned by the present Akal Takht Mariada, but today they are still practised most prominently amongst the Akali Nihangs. It's also of note that cannabis was never smoked and was only ever allowed in the form of a drink, bung. Smoking tobacco and hookah has always been strictly prohibited in all Khalsa literature. Interestingly, one of the most prominent of the 12 missiles of the Dal Khalsa, the Pangi missile, which was not led by Akali Nihangs, was named after their love for Pang. This was in keeping with the Indic martial ethos of the time. The Gyanni tradition of the Gyanni Abunga at the heart of Harmandar Sahib formed the Khalsa's leading intellectual institution. A bunga in Persian is a place of rest or residence. Many of these bungas were present within the precincts of Harmandar Sahib complex in the pre-colonial era. Different groups, including the Akalis, Gyanis, Nirmalas, Udasis, and other musicians set up within these different bungas, which are now largely extinct. Up to 69 have been listed in pre-colonial sources. The Gyanni Abunga was where the Gyanis resided. The Gyanni tradition wasn't really strictly a sect as they followed Khalsa customs and Rehat, but for the purposes of this documentary, it's been demarked to better help understand the Sikh universe and the lineages of this tradition. The first real mentions of the Gyanni tradition as a lineage going back to Guru Gobind Singh appears in later Sikh literature of the late 1700s to early 1800s, once Khalsa Raj was well established. There are, however, interesting hints of connections with earlier members of this lineage, as you shall see in our bonus video, which will go into more depth on the Gyanis. There's also much confusion with its link to Damdami Taksal, which will also be explained. The Khalsa Sardars bestowed the honorific title of Gyanni onto these individuals during Sikh rule. The Khalsa at large valued their knowledge and exegesis of traditional scripture as well as their ability to expound and proselytize this message. In addition to being grantis, these Gyanis taught scholars at the Gyanni Abunga, 
and also helped with the major refurbishment of the Harmandar Sab, the most notable being the one carried out by Sant Singh Gyanni during Khalsa Raj involving the plating of gold. Sant Singh Gyanni also joined the Maharaja on military campaigns and was a seasoned soldier. The Gyanni lineage claims back to Bai Mani Singh and is reproduced from the Mahan Kosh by Khan Singh Nabba below. This line of the Gyanni Abunga is not a family tree, but one of a student learning from his master. The famous Kavi Sandok Singh, the author of Suraj Prakash, learnt from Sant Singh Gyanni, who resided in the Gyanni Abunga. The Suraj Prakash text to this day forms the basis of kathas on the lives of the gurus in most gurdwaras all over the world. Sant Singh Gyanni and his student Kavi Sandok Singh utilised Sikh texts and engaged with the content from the wider Snatan or Indic universe, which was incredibly popular at the time. This second chart, reproduced from Oberoi, shows the family tree of Sant Singh Gyanni, who formed one of the Gyanni families at Harmandar Sab. This is a family tree, unlike the previous chart. The Gyannis have continued into modernity, albeit in different locations and not at the Gyanni Abunga, which is now extinct. We should look to explore this in future productions. Before the Singh Sabha movement, the Guru lineages played an important role in disseminating Sikh theology to the masses, whilst remaining well within the Khalsa fold. The Bedis were of Guru Nanak's lineage, the Soddis of Guru Ram Das's lineage, the Trehans of Guru Angad's lineage, and the Palla clan of Guru Amar Das's lineage. They all received generous patronage as the Sikhs rose to power, with the earliest mention of a grant being given by a Sikh ruler to Guru Charat Singh Bedi in 1756. Eventually, the Bedis and Soddis received 40% of all religious charity revenues endowed by the Lahore state, more than any other group or sect during this period. Being descendants from the Gurus, they received enormous respect, and some even worshipped them in the same light as the Orthodox Gurus themselves. The Khatri descendants of Guru Nanak, the Bedis, predominantly resided at Dera Baba Nanak in Gurdaspur and at Unna. Baba Kalladari was a prominent descendant of Guru Nanak and was a contemporary of Guru Gobind Singh. Baba Kalladari's grandson, Guru Sahib Singh Bedi, came to be one of the most famous Bedis and rose to prominence in the latter half of the 18th century for his military exploits with other Sardars. Guru Sahib Singh Bedi later went on to help Ranjit Singh unite the various missile chiefs and coronated Maharaja Ranjit Singh in 1801 with a tikka as he ascended the throne. A Christian missionary of the period, Reverend Joseph Wolfe, described Guru Sahib Singh Bedi as the Pope of the Sikhs, and he is quoted to have said that he can curse the Maharaja and all the Sardars, and they humbly bow before him. Guru Bikram Singh Bedi, a son of Guru Sahib Singh, also received generous patronage from the Khalsa Lahore Durbar. He rose up to stir a rebellion against the British in 1849 during the Second Anglo-Sikh War, fighting at Shaliyamala and Gujarat as he was dispossessed of his arms and considerable amount of his land after the First Anglo-Sikh War. The Bedis of the Rawal Pindi district will be talked about in a future episode, as they become prominent in and around the Singh Sabha period. The Sordis form the orthodox lineage of the Gurus, from Guru Ramdas up to Guru Gobind Singh. Nonetheless, there were also different breakaway sects which formed through the Sordi descendants of different Gurus, where they had set up their own Gurgaddi. A few of these were mentioned in our previous videos as the five prohibited groups for Khalsa Sikhs and included the Minnas and Tir Malias. The Sordis of Kartarpur were the most famous, holding the Kartarpuri Bir of Guru Granth Sahib, the first Bir which was scribed by Pai Gurdas from Guru Arjan. They were descendants from Tir Mal, a grandson of Guru Hargobind. This sect had been excommunicated by Guru Gobind Singh and was later brought back into the Khalsa fold. This is actually an interesting example of the Guru Pant in action, as it adapted to the circumstances of the times, and it led to Baba Vardbag Singh Soddi to be given Khande Di Paul by Sardar Jassa Singh Aluwalia. During the Khalsa Raj era, the Kartarpuri Bir was carried in military expeditions to provide sanctity for the Khalsa army. Huge Sangats gathered at the headquarters of the Kartarpuri Soddis, particularly during Vasakhi, with the Soddi Guru of the time, Guru Sadhu Singh, reading directly from the Bir. The Sordis of Anandpur were also prominent. They controlled land around Anandpur, holding many key shrines around this area. 
They played a particular role in popular folk religious practices, including the curing of illnesses as well as the dispensing of religious instructions. They received thousands of adherents during major festivals, and lavish state patronage was provided to them during the time of Khalsa Raj. So far, we've covered the Khalsa, but now we'll be moving on to the Kulasa and looking at the other side of the chart. The first of these Kulasa sects we'll be covering will be the Order of the Odasis. The Odasis were formed by Sirichand, Guru Nanak's eldest son. The Odasis were the first deviant sect away from the orthodox Sikh Sangat of the Gurus. An Odasi was defined as one who was a renunciate and who had shunned the material world. This also meant that they remained celibate in contrast to the family lifestyles of the Gurus. The word Odasi was also used to refer to Guru Nanak's travels which extended well beyond the borders of modern-day India. Much like Guru Nanak, Sri Chand also travelled across India and beyond, spreading his father's message. There appears to be little evidence of open hostility against Guru Nanak from Sri Chand, and he even created matras in praise of his father. Nonetheless, it appears that he developed a following of his own after the Gurgaddi was given to Guru Angad. After a stiff relationship with the second and third gurus, relations between Odasis and Sikhs soon improved by the time of Guru Ramdas. In 1629, Guru Hargobind gifted his own son Baba Gurditta to Sirichand, and Baba Gurditta went on to becoming Sirichand's second in line. The Udasis were sent by later gurus on long expeditions to preach Sikhi, going up to modern day Afghanistan in the west and Assam in the east. These extended further in the 19th century, as certain British and Sikh sources document Udasi establishments as far as St. Petersburg and Astrakhan in Russia. Guru Gobind Singh, in fact, fought alongside prominent Odasis like Mahant Kirpaldas, and the Guru had bestowed the Odasis with shrines such as Siskanj in Anandpur Sahib for caretaking. Even so, the Odasis still remained the heterodox order and did not initiate the Sangat through Khande Dipal. Instead, they had their own initiation ceremony of Charanamrat, where the toes of five Odasi Mahants were placed in nectar which adherents would drink from. They therefore did not believe in the Khalsa doctrine of the Guru Granth and Guru Pant, and they still recognised their own line of successors. The early successors of Sirichand had placed Sirichand's matras on par with Japji Sahib. A popular Odasi text from the early 1800s placed Baba Gurditta, Guru Hargobind's son, as the seventh Guru after Guru Hargobind, who then in turn nominated Guru Harrai as his successor. There was a considerable diversity of practices amongst the Odasis. They believed that woman and gold were the two main temptations to avoid, and they abstained from alcohol and meat too. Das and Brahm were surnames given to Odasis. Odasis greeted each other with Beri Pena, I worship your feet, and used different salutations including Gajoji Vaheguru instead of Bolloji Vaheguru. Many of their establishments practiced yoga along with Duni, the continuous smouldering fire. Idols were very commonly present. Their dress sense varied, and they shouldn't always be seen as being synonymous with the naked Odasi sect commonly seen in colonial pictures. Some also wore white, others preferred ochre or red-coloured garments. Some remained clean-shaven, whilst the wearing of the silly topi would have also been common amongst the Odasis too. Much like orthodox Sikhs, the Odasis did recite Japji, Rehras and Kirtan Suhilla, and they also would have kept the Granth Sahib in their institutions too prior to the Singh Sabha movement. The Granth Sahib would usually have been placed alongside other revered Indic texts, including the Vedas. In the pre-colonial age, the syncretic practices of the Odasis led to the transmission of Sikhi amongst many Hindus. As well as having their own shrines and institutions, they maintained a degree of control over major Sikh Gurdwaras too. After the death of Guru Gobind Singh, Udasi Mahants were in charge as custodians of Takht Hazur Sahib. Udasis helped managing shrines during the times Khalsa Sikhs came under immense persecution in the 18th century. They then benefited enormously from the generous patronage that Sikh Sardars had bestowed on them after the 1770s when the Khalsa began ruling principalities in Punjab. Udasi establishments thus rose to prominence in parallel with the Khalsa's triumph. Many of the institutions formed dual religious and educational facilities, which in many ways formed the basis of the pre-colonial education. 
Their centres of learning increased rapidly from 12 to 250 by the end of the Khalsa Raj. Their establishments were connected with schools which taught science, maths and traditional Ayurvedic medicine. During the Khalsa Raj, Udasi Mahants had the Akhara Brambuta within the precincts of Harmandar Sahib. It had 200 resident sadhus who were well versed in Sikh scriptures as well as 70 musicians and provided free accommodation and langar to the poor. They received large amounts of patronage by Maharaja Ranjit Singh and up to 10% of all the religious endowments handed out by the Sikh state were given to the Udasis. Only those of the Guru lineages, the Biddis and Soddis, received more grants from the Sikh state's treasury at around 40%. The cultural landscape changed significantly, however, during the British rule. The Udasis now went from having a state-funded institution to becoming largely privatised due to the significant reduction in funding. The patronage dropped by 25% from Sikh rule in the 1850s. The British, however, did employ their own Udasi Mahants and demanded their loyalty to the colonial apparatus. The meteoric rise of the Singh Sabha movement, which later brought about Gurdwara reforms, led to a radical reduction in the influence of the Udasis over Sikh shrines. As religious boundaries became more defined, syncretic practices lessened. The Udasis began to consider themselves as wholly Hindu and often went as far as denying their Sikh past altogether. Petitions were set up by some Udasis to list as Hindus, threatening to boycott the 1931 census without this change. This was as a result of the consolidation of Sikhism and Hinduism as we know today. For this reason, they have been placed into Hinduism in modernity. If you'd like to learn more about the effect of censuses on religious boundaries, then please see our first video. The Nanak Pantis can be defined as those who follow the path of Guru Nanak. In a modern post-colonial sense, the term is often used to define those who, like the Udasis, followed the tenets of Guru Nanak, but less so of the other Gurus, especially Guru Gobind Singh and the Guru Pant. Their growth is really threefold. This included contact with Guru Nanak whilst on his missions towards the West. Later, but crucially, Guru Nanak's Udasi son, Sirichan's missionary activities, and even later, the effect of Khatri traders moving out west towards the Silk Road and forming key Nanak Panti establishments. Prior to the Singh Sabha movement, Nanak Pantis in general remained Sahajdari and did not take Khande Di Pol, nor did they adhere to the five Ks. They did keep the Guru Granth within their establishments, but like the Udasis, they maintained a considerable syncretic influence amongst Hindus and Muslims too. Nanak Pantis can thus be used as an umbrella term and they consisted of Sikhs, Muslims and Hindus, depending on their own beliefs and practices. They placed a different emphasis on whichever scriptures and practices suited them the most. However, their belief in Guru Nanak's teachings as well as the Guru Granth formed their core belief. In a shift from the majority Udasi celibate ascetics, the Nanak Pantis like Guru Nanak are householders with families. Their dress sense varied, with some preferring to keep the Seli Topi as worn by Guru Nanak. Today, Nanak Pantis hold greater stead in the frontier regions of the subcontinent, far off from the core population of Sikhs in Punjab. A fascinating account by Richard Burton in 1851 provides more context on the Nanak Pantis of Sindh in what is now modern-day Pakistan. He observes that they show a general tendency towards the faith of Nanak Shah, and that many castes have so intermingled their religion of the Sikhs with their original Hinduism that we can scarcely discern the line of demarcation. Nowadays, Nanak Panti temples in Sindh contain a mix of darbars with the Guru Granth Sahib inside them, with Hindu idols too. Guru Nanak Dev in Sindh is commonly called Baba Nanak Shah, with the Islamic influence playing a part in this difference in nomenclature. There are also beers of Guru Granth Sahib in Sindhi, which instead use the Persia Arabic script. Nanak Pantis in Balochistan are similar, and there are considerably less Khalsa Sikhs in these areas too. Like the Udasis, many of these Nanak Pantis in Balochistan now label themselves as Hindus as opposed to Sahajdari Sikhs. This came with the 1931 census, after the Singh Sabha movement, which showed a drastic reduction in the percentage of Sahajdari Sikhs in Balochistan. This instead corresponded with an increase in Hindus. The Nanak Pantis in our chart have been placed in the modern era as a mix of Sajdari Sikhs and Hindus. 
depending on the emphasis placed by adherents to different doctrines. For example, those following more traditional orthodox Sikh practices reject idols completely. Idols have been strongly against Sikh tradition from very early on, as stated in the prominent Dabbestan text, written even prior to the formation of the Khalsa by a Persian writer. It's also important to note that in the Singh Sabha period, some Nanak Pantis would be admitted within the Khalsa fold, especially through the efforts of Akali Nihang Kaur Singh in Afghanistan, along with the Birdis of the Guru lineage. The Nirmalas were another prominent sect within the 18th century milieu. The word Nirmal from Nirmala means pure. There are in fact so few mentions of the Nirmalas before the Khalsa obtained hegemony in the mid-1700s that many prominent scholars even go as far as questioning their very early existence. The first mentions of the Nirmalas as a sect appears towards the latter half of the 1700s. Later Sikh sources suggest that Guru Gobind Singh started a project to translate Sanskrit classics into Braj or Punjabi and had asked Pandit Raghunath to teach the Sikh Sanskrit. The Pandit, however, had refused, citing that Sanskrit, being the language of the gods, was not for those Sikhs who had come from lower caste backgrounds. This led to the Guru sending five Sikhs, including one named Karam Singh, dressed as an upper-class student to Banares, a traditional seat of Hindu learning. These Sikhs became scholars of classical Indian theology, and Karam Singh went on to start the lineage of the Nirmalas, who continued practicing Sikhi using Vedantic philosophy. The Nirmalas formed groups of travelling ascetics and set up akharas in areas of traditional Brahmanical learning, such as Hardwar, Allahabad and Vanasi. Here, they received teaching in the study of ancient Hindu texts like the Vedas and Puranas. Because of this, they henceforth interpreted Sikh scriptures through a very Vedantic lens. They also placed a greater emphasis on memorising and transcribing large portions of these texts. Much like the Odasis in pre-colonial India, they were able to draw upon Sikh commonalities with the wider Indic universe, and by utilising the more fluid religious boundaries of the time, they were able to proselytise Sikhi amongst Hindus. They commonly planted the flag of Sikhi on the occasion of Kumbh Millas. During their early period of prominence, Nirmalas, similar to the Odasis, placed little emphasis on taking Khande Di Paul or believing in the concept of the Guru Pant. They remained celibate and strictly shunned meat, alcohol and other intoxicants. Unlike the Odasis, they had much less of a role in managing Gurdwaras and had only begun doing so with increasing numbers after colonial rule. Even at the height of Ranjit Singh's empire, in 1832, one British official wrote about how their numbers were few and that they were always found in centres of Hindu learning. The patronage received by the Nirmalas was less than 10% of all religious grants received by the Udasis. After the empire's fall, the states south of the Satluj River in Malva continued to be semi-autonomous and were ruled by Sikh Sardars, who had been under the dominion of the British. These principalities, including the state of Patiala in particular, had patronised many Nirmala sadhus. The period between the fall of Khalsa Raj and just before the Singh Sabha movements was perhaps the decades of most significant growth for the Nirmalas. In return for their patronage, however, the Sardars of these principalities required the Nirmalas to follow a specific code of conduct for the management of Gurdwara facilities. This included the five Ks and a list of other commandments. Their ochre-coloured dress also came under scrutiny and they were required to switch to white. Even so, plenty of Nirmalas would shun these rulings, believing that they were not bound by Khalsa customs and Rehat. The Kali Nihangs had also pressured the Nirmalas to bind by these Khalsa customs, believing that only those adhering to Khalsa norms should be the Gurdwara custodians, with the only legitimate exception being the Udasis. This eventually led many Nirmalas, especially those who were Gurdwara Mahants, to eventually take Khande Di Paul, and accepting the Khalsa's code of conduct. However, at this point, most who did still shunned some of the Kakars, including the Kirpan and Kashera, believing them not to suit their more peaceful way of life. Their dress varied considerably, including the loin cloth, saffron coloured dress, lorta and sorti. They generally kept their kis like Khalsa Sikhs. It is for this reason that in this period of their history, the Nirmalas are shown to be overlapping with both the Khalsa and the Khulasa. During the Singh Sabha period, members of the Nirmalas, Udasis and Gyanis and other scholars 
all of whom interpreted Sikh writings through the Indic framework, formed part of a committee to produce a commentary on the whole of Guru Granth Sahib. This was named the Farid Kortika, which remains highly influential today. Interestingly, in its own words, it states its intentions to produce a commentary using Snatani framework, which they felt was being lost in this period of great cultural change. During the Singh Sabha period, the Nirmalas formed numerous offshoots, including the popular Damdami Taksal and the Nanaksar. Many other sants and babas ascribed their teachings from these Nirmala schools of thought, as we shall see later. During the Singh Sabha period, these different groups retained the influence of the Nirmala teachings, but now gave great importance to Khandedi Pal, and have since contributed to making the modern-day Khalsa as we know. A notable Singh Sabha Amritsar scholar of the Khalsa Nirmalas was Gyanni Gyan Singh, whose rehat for the Khalsa was cited at the end of our previous video. The mainstream Nirmala fold declined after the Singh Sabha period due to their heterodox beliefs. They were either pushed towards becoming more Sikh and taking Khandedi Pal, or moving more into the Hindu fold, much like the Udasis. Their control of Gurdwaras completely diminished after the SGPC took control of Gurdwaras following the Singh Sabha movement. The term Seva Pantis means the path of Seva or selfless service, and they too stake their claim from the time of the Gurus. They were also known as Adan Shahis from one of their other early leaders. Later Sikh sources suggest that the Seva Pantis were formed by Pai Kanaya, a Sikh of Guru Tegh Bahadur. Originally an officer in the service of the Mughals, he became a drawer of water to the Guru's horses. Guru Tegh Bahadur would invest him with the Seli Topi and he went on to become a loyal follower of Guru Gobind Singh. It is mentioned in later Sikh sources that at the Battle of Anandpur, he famously gave water to the wounded on both sides of the battle, including the Sikhs and the Mughals as well as their allies. On being questioned about why he was giving water to the enemy, he replied that everywhere he saw none but the Guru. Some sources suggest that he was commissioned by Guru Gobind Singh to go to Sindh to continue his selfless service. Pai Kanaya's legacy continued with his followers Adan Shah and Sevaram. Sevaram continued preaching in Sindh, modern-day Pakistan, and formed Deras or Tekanas. Sevapantis earned a reputation of performing Seva wherever they could, including the construction of wells, water tanks, and ponds for the needy. Along with their Seva, they were strong exponents of the Katha tradition much like the Udasis and Nirmalas. In line with other sants and babas, they perceived maya and sensual pleasures as the greatest obstacles in the way of achieving a divine state. A prominent Sevapanti leader, Pai Sevaram, set a precedent of remaining single and avoiding all interactions with women. He even considered flirting as dangerous. They were similar to the Udasis and the Nirmalas in that they also put an emphasis on interpreting Gurbani through a Vedic and Puranic lens. However, by preaching in areas like Sindh, where the Muslim population was high, their syncretic tendencies often overlapped with Islamic customs too. In particular, they read and explained Sufi commentaries of the Quran, as well as Rumi's literature. Sevapantis were seen in these areas as being akin to Sufi dervishes. They initially remained celibate and put little emphasis on Khandedi Pal. The Sevapantis also strictly avoided meat, alcohol and other intoxicants, like the Udasis and Nirmalas. They wore a loin cloth in their deras and switched to cotton white sheets on going outside. As time went on, some Sevapanti started taking Khandedi Pal. Much of this was through the influence of Guru Sahib Singh Bedi, one of Guru Nanak's descendants mentioned earlier. This phenomena increased during the Singh Sabha period. There is a notable mention of a prominent Sevapanti, Baba Sham Singh, bestowing Khandedi Pal on Pai Veer Singh, a prominent Lahore Singh Sabha scholar. Today there is still a strong Sahajdari tradition amongst many Sevapantis, and for this reason they have now been placed between the Khalsa and Sahajdaris, much like the Nirmalas after the Singh Sabha period. Today Sevapantis are mainly prevalent amongst Khatris in Sindh, and blend in quite well with the Nanakpantis of this region. As explained earlier, Sindh was highly influenced by the Udasi missions. This makes the reverence for Sirichand particularly prominent. Interestingly, the temple Khatvadi Darbar Shikapur in present-day Sindh has a cot in the supposed location where Pai Kanaya preached. This Darbar forms a confluence of different syncretic religious practices, which includes Sevapanti paraphernalia, 
idols and the Guru Granth. An interesting point to note is that when adherents attend this shrine, they usually go under the Guru Granth Sahib and stretch their legs multiple times in veneration of Bhai Kanaya, being far off in frontier regions. They too have had little influence from the SGPC and other Khalsa organizations with a minuscule Khalsa Sikh presence in these areas. As we shall see, there is a large Sevabanti influence amongst different Sants and Babas, which are now prominent. Thank you for watching this video. Please do like, subscribe and share. So far we have covered some of the main early sects. None of the sects so far discussed were founded after the 18th century. In future videos, we'll be looking at the Sikh landscape later on in the 19th and 20th centuries to the present mix we see today. Though many of the sects covered in this documentary have severely diminished in following the numbers, their legacy still continues within the Sikh universe today and we'll be looking to cover this in more depth in a future production.